Welcome to the Engineering Influence Podcast presented by the American Council of Engineering Companies and sponsored by the ACC Life Health Trust. A frequent refrain across all businesses right now is that strategic planning is a challenge because of all the uncertainty in the market and business owners are waiting until the economy normalizes before they can start looking too deep into the future. Our guest on the podcast today says this is a strategic mistake. John Getty is president of Getty and Associates, a management consulting and training firm serving clients nationwide with leadership development and project management training, strategic planning, succession planning, and market research services. John recently presented an ACEC online class titled, How Do You Create Strategies in a World Like This? So let's find out. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Jerry. So is this really such a hard time to plan or are we just suffering from uh, pandemic anxiety? You know, I have no doubts whatsoever that we are suffering from some aspects of pandemic anxiety because in many ways our world was upended. Everything that seemed normal to us suddenly wasn't normal and we were in some uncharted territory, you know, people having to work from home and uh, not being able to go out and meet face to face with clients. So there were some changes, I think, that we had to adapt to. I think our industry uh, in general is probably a little more uh, secluded from the effects of the pandemic than many others in this country, but certainly there was some of it. I, I think that this is a great time to plan. And I think that more firms are paralyzed in their ability to plan uh, by uncertainty. You know, in many ways, the engineering world is certain. There are right answers when we're trying to solve client problems. And uncertainty is really not a comfortable place for us to be. So I think the combination of post-pandemic uh, lack of normalcy and the fact that we like certain answers has hamstrung a lot of firms from being willing to take on this uh, challenge of strategic planning. In my opinion, now is probably a more important time than ever to do it. I would also think that if other firms aren't doing it, it, it would be a strategic advantage to, to, to start some, some forward thinking planning. I absolutely believe that. I think what people have to come to terms with uh, at the beginning is that the old traditional model of strategic planning, which you have a, a three to five time year, a three to five year time horizon, is probably not valid at this point. It doesn't mean that it should be thrown out and throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I think it's still very valid to have those long term goals and objectives that maybe you set a couple of years ago when you did your strategic plan. We don't wanna throw those out just because the world has changed somehow, but what we might have to do is change our outlook a little bit so that we are thinking in shorter term intervals. You know, We might want to be looking at things that are uh, six months to a year out rather than something that's three to five years out. That doesn't mean those strategies we came up with that were valid for a three to five year time horizon uh, should be thrown out. On the other hand, three to five years as a time horizon, which is the traditional role of strategic planning, has always been a little bit suspect. Uh, the world changes so dynamically that it's really hard to decide what's going to happen in three to five years. So I, I think now is the time that the firms that are spending time and energy doing planning, focusing on planning, are the firms that are going to be uh, standing, standing up in, in the end. I think that you know, strategies are not permanent. We have to get away from the idea that everything's gonna work perfectly as we plan our futures out. It's not, we're going to see some obstacles. Uh, strategies are more like water. Uh, they adapt when they encounter obstacles. And so that's to me, the, the key to success here is don't take it so seriously that everything is locked in stone in this three to five year time horizon. Just say that in the short term, here are our plans. We're still moving toward those longer term goals. But right now is the time to start planning for the future. Uh, you've heard of the concept of scenario planning. I'm sure we'll speak more about that. But scenario planning is a good way to anticipate the eventualities that could occur, good and bad. And when we do strategic planning using scenarios, we kind of adapt to uh, a world of possibilities in the future. We're not going to identify every single thing that's going to happen, but it allows us to start to frame what would we do in certain circumstances? What would we do if the world changed uh, thus and so? So I think that the companies that pay attention to planning right now as robustly as we can do it in the environment that we're in are the ones that are gonna be way ahead when it comes to their competitors. Um, to some degree, I, 
one cannot forecast the future, obviously, but a, a fair assumption would be that this pandemic period that we're, we're in, apparently coming to an end or coming to some sort of normalcy, um, that, that's like a one, that's like a one-off, a, a black swan event. And it's not something someone could plan for, but it's also not something that necessarily is gonna leave a permanent mark on the market landscape. You know, the, there's still sectors that are hot. There's still sectors that are cold. You know, data centers, warehouses, hot. Um, isn't isn't the market fundamentally still the same and as it as it was before the the pandemic? I think you're right in many ways, Jerry. I think it's true that the fundamental market drivers that were in place before the pandemic are still there. I mean, much of engineering is driven by demographic trends and you know population shifts from the rust belt to the to the sun belt states and when you have population increases in an area it certainly drives the need for infrastructure whether that's roadways or housing or water and sewer connections or even retail uh, but how those services are delivered may change a lot of times people say well you can't predict a black swan that's something that's so impactful and hard to predict that we can't ac actually plan for it to me that's where scenario planning comes in because actually we can anticipate things uh, in terms of scenario planning, good and bad scenarios that may impact our business. And it's okay to think large here. Uh, Joel Barker, who's a futurist who I follow pretty regularly, says, you know, what is impossible in our industry today that would fundamentally change things if it were to happen? And it's, he's really talking about paradigm shifts in the way we deliver services. Um, you know, it, it, railroads didn't anticipate the interstate highway system. And so they were almost left behind by saying they were railroad companies rather than transportation companies. Uh, Bill Gates at Microsoft in his memoir talked about initially not seeing the potential of the internet or, or didn't think that it would get widespread consumer interest. So we're talking about some fundamental changes that really in a way, when you have a paradigm shift puts everybody back at zero. So scenario planning is a good way to think about if these things were to happen, what would we do? Now, nobody ever before the pandemic, I think, was thinking in that way. You know, what if we have a worldwide pandemic uh, that causes changes in the way people work and the way they shop and everything else? I think that there's been some significant learning from that experience that we can plan for things through scenario planning. Uh, but I think the way we deliver our services may change. It's not only our industry that's changed. It's the clients that we serve. If you think about the healthcare industry, you know, pre-pandemic uh, hospitals had been on a move towards space consolidation, uh, which benefited really in, in the way that patient rooms could be reconfigured on the fly. That was a whole purpose of that was to save space. And so you could have a, a patient room that was for just general population patients or had the ability on the fly to serve uh, ICU and ICU and uh, critical care patients. So that provided some capacity to handle the pandemic overflow in other wards. And uh, even though capacity issues in healthcare were bad enough as it was during the pandemic, if those shifts had not been made to accommodate more critically ill patients in other wards, we would have really been in, in trouble. So I think, you know, in the healthcare industry, my daughter is a nurse and she was uh, trained as an osteopathic nurse but she was serving a whole variety of patients because of the need for capacity. So hospitals were already in that situation. As we look to our clients and see how our clients are adapting to post-pandemic, that is what will help us with the scenario planning. You know, you're right, data centers still hot because more people are working from home. Uh, warehouses because of enhanced e-commerce. But those things were already on an uptrend before the pandemic hit. They just became more important more crucial to our everyday lives, I think, after the pandemic. But I, the fundamental markets uh, have not changed. The drivers are still there, but the way we deliver services uh, is really, I think, where we need to look at how we're going to change our own businesses to reflect that. Clients, how are they adapting to the pandemic? What has changed in their world? You know, I've done some client satisfaction surveys in the past for firms, and one of the things that I hear as a common theme is that uh, there's almost an arrogance sometimes that engineers think they have the great solution. And uh, I, believe me, I love engineers, but I'm not sure that we have all the answers all the time. Uh, rather, I think we can come up with answers if we start with where the client's pain is and figure out a way to provide an appropriate remedy. But it doesn't work looking for, you know, where's a square hole that I can put this square peg in. 
So I think we need to always visualize our adaptations in a post-pandemic world to the way our client base is adapting. Uh, I'm still optimistic. I'm still a rosy optimist about the long-term uh, work that we do in the engineering world, but with a, a little tempered approach to it by saying, you know, the, the delivery, the ultimate delivery to the end user may change. On the, the scenario planning concept, I, I, it makes me think of the old movie War Games in which the computer has several hundred scenarios for various uh, war options mm -hmm. um, that the, the United States military uh, cons was, was analyzing in, in for its military preparedness. Um, is that, I mean, is, are you talking about firms having several dozen, several hundred scenarios? What, I mean, how many scenarios would you have to do before you uh, thought of a worldwide pandemic? Yeah, I, I, and again, I don't, I can't predict that we would have ever anticipated a worldwide pandemic, although, you know, the good news is, I mean, historic, it has happened in the past, right? right. I mean, we had the Spanish flu epidemic, the Asian flu epidemic, the bird flu, and, uh, and those kinds of things, they have happened in the past. So they're not outside the realm of possibility, whether they would have shown up as something that would have been widespread enough to affect our business and our delivery methods. Uh, I'm not sure that that would have happened. But I will say in answer to your question this, I think, you know, you, you have to have some sort of limitation on how many scenarios you plan. I'm talking probably a half dozen to 10 max. And those are not even fully fleshed out. I think anything beyond that, where you get into the dozens or hundreds of scenarios, are, are probably not a worthwhile expenditure of resources. So how would you do that then? You would pick things that are, are most likely to happen given an environment. And I keep going back to this, but view the world through your client's lens. You know, see the world through their situation, not the engineering prism. We're really good as an industry, I think, at reflecting internally, not so good sometimes at reflecting externally about the world that our clients are living in. So when we start thinking about ways to uh, change scenarios or to plan for different scenarios, uh, one good way to get a kickstart on that is to think about what's happening at, that has changed the fundamental uh, business models of the clients that we serve. I can remember years ago when I was working with a firm and we were talking, they had a surveying uh, unit in the, in the company. And we said, what would fundamentally change uh, the industry if it were uh, something that occurred. And I think one of the people in my, my uh, group said, well, if, if survey licensed surveyors were no longer used or, or no longer needed, if there were an, and this is way before drone technology, but if there were a way to basically buy an off the shelf software package, it would help you do your own survey at home. And especially now that we have drone technology to assist in that, you know, what would happen? It would fundamentally upend the survey industry. I'm not suggesting that's going to happen or that that's an extreme, but if you look at what's happened in the survey world already, how many people do it used to take to go out and do surveys? How many people on a crew? Now you can take one person out with one piece of electronics and basically do what 10 or 12 people used to do, not 10 or 12, but you know, a, a survey crew. So I think, you know, a limited number of scenarios and again, putting your, your bets on the ones that are most likely to occur or would have the greatest impact if they occur. I consider it sort of like risk management. If we were doing risk management on a project plan, you know, we would try to anticipate those things that either have the greatest impact or the highest probability of occurrence. And really the, the key point there would be those that have both, a huge impact if they occur and a, a very significant probability of occurrence. So that will eliminate some of the more bad, you know, so some of the more out there scenarios that you would come up with. I don't think you can legitimately pay anything but lip service to you when you get more than six to 10. Um, you, you, you mentioned a few times about uh, looking, looking at the world through your client's eyes. I, I, I can't speak for uh, engineering firms specifically, but anecdotally, I would, I would posit that most strategic planning is done from the inside out. What do we want to achieve? Where, where do we want to be in five years? Is how how does a firm 
change the focus there. Uh, you're absolutely right about that. That's one of my biggest complaints about strategic planning in most organizations. When I look at, when I'm doing strategic planning work with a firm, and I'm looking at the strategic plan, very, very often it's very operational in nature. It's not strategic at all. Because if you want to be strategic, you have to ask tough questions. Are we in the right business? Are we serving the right clients? Uh, are there services that we're providing that are dogs that we need to divest ourselves of? Are there clients that we're serving that no longer uh, profit us? And you have to sacrifice some lambs here, some uh, sacred lambs that in the past were not up for discussion. So I think that you really have to do that. You know, Peter Drucker, who's the management guru, said, you know, people in any organization uh, are going to be attached to the obsolete, the things that once were productive and no longer are. And we could apply that to dog clients or dog service lines and recognizing what we don't recognize often is that if we freed up those resources by dumping those uh, dog clients or dog services, now we have resources which could be used for higher purposes. There's always an opportunity cost. But in answer to your original question there, and I'm sorry I got off on a diatribe here, but in answer to your original question, no question about it. Most strategic planning in organizations is internally focused because that's what we know. We know what our capabilities are. We have a fairly good idea where we fit in the marketplace. We know what we're doing internally, and yet we don't have anything to benchmark it against from an external view. I'm much more interested in the external impact on my firm than I am the internal portions of it. I did a strategic plan one time for a group and the president of the firm had the really the right idea. He said, look, I will survive. My firm will survive no matter how the world changes around us. You know, we're not gonna go away just because the world changes. We will adapt to the world. But the only way you can adapt is if you know what's happening in the external world. And my big complaint about strategic plans by and large is that they're done. They sit on a, a, a bookshelf gathering some dust and uh, quite frankly, they're not strategic at all because it's basically taking the last time we did a strategic plan and uh, updating it a little bit to make it more palatable. So if we were gonna have three offices uh, in the last strategic plan, now we're gonna make it four. And I don't mean to, to diss that. I mean, it's not that simplistic, but really it's not asking tough questions and it's not externally focused, it's internally focused. I am actually not as concerned if we end up with a strategic plan as much as I am the thinking process behind it, the strategic thinking, you know, because that means you're asking tough and critical questions. If you have a strategic plan that gathers dust, uh, I'm not sure that's necessarily worth anything. I think that a strategic plan where you've been through the exercise of thinking strategically about our business is far more important than whatever ends up being shown on paper. I'm not suggesting that you don't want to write it down. I think it was Dwight Eisenhower when he was president said plans are useless, but planning is indispensable because that's the process you go through to ever get a strategic plan. And I think that is the, the huge differentiator is uh, you can't do a strategic plan without strategic thinking in place as well. And I think that's the first step. So how do you get out of the mold of taking a strategic plan? How about starting from scratch? You don't you don't you challenge your assumptions rather than rely on what you found out last time when you did a strategic plan you challenge your assumptions about everything and uh, you may find that some of those things that you planned for last time don't matter anymore others may still be valid but you have to get out of the mindset of thinking in an internal way and think externally in a ironic sense did did the pandemic year sort of knock people out of their comfort zone? I think it knocked a lot of us out, and I'm including myself in that. Uh, you know, when the when the world changed, and my my model has traditionally been as a consultant, where I would go visit clients and I would get engaged with them, you know, with in-person assignments, whether it be training and development or strategic planning, and all of a sudden that all went on hold. So you have to rethink the, the world. And I, in many ways, I think the pandemic did knock us out of our comfort zone. What I'm afraid of is that as things start to normalize, we'll go back to business as usual. We won't think we need to strategically think any longer. We'll just bring out the old strategic plan, dust it off and go through another exercise of trying to update it. Uh, I think what we ought to learn from this is the importance of 
uh, revisiting the whole strategic planning process. You know, Forbes magazine, I read an article recently that said, you know, complexity breeds ambiguity and lack of clarity. And I think that's kind of where we are now. We, we experienced complexity in this pandemic that no one had anticipated. And so it's very easy to allow that to fuzzy, uh, to fuzz up the, the edges of what we're doing and uh, make it seem like it's impossible to plan. Uh, I, I'm absolutely a firm believer in the opposite of that. One of the, the, the big uh, sort of developments, I think, that occurred over the year past year was rapid adaptation of technology to meet the, the changed market, mm -hmm. uh, the, all the uh, working from home and such, and meeting with clients virtually, uh, site visits, virtual site visits, such, stuff like that. And you made the point in your talk that technology can can be a, a differentiator for firms that they can use it to, if the, like the early adapters can use it to command higher fees and face, and then as a result, face fewer competitors. Do you, is this an area that, that you see firms looking at right now to take advantage of technology? It's, it's really interesting, Jerry, because what I saw in the pandemic and after the pandemic had occurred about midway through it, probably last fall when we were still kind of in the throes of it, uh, I talked to some of my clients for an article I was writing about the adaptations they had had to make. And there were things that people brought up that, you know, nobody had ever thought about, like staggering schedules when people came back to work. So you didn't have more than a couple of people in the elevator at a time. Some things that you just wouldn't have anticipated. But what I found was there was a group of my clients and, and people who weren't my clients yet who were very forward thinking. They had already been embracing technology and the need to work from home, not as a requirement because of the pandemic, but because of a benefit or a perk to entice employees. So they were already ramping up their infrastructure, uh, their IT infrastructure. And so it was very easy for them when this uh, pandemic presented itself to slip into that uh, accelerated infrastructure uh, movement and they didn't really lose anything in that process. Others had to ramp up from basically nothing where they people were in the office and they didn't work from home much, or at least the technology was constrained and things like that. So I think there were forward thinking companies that saw no real impact whatsoever. When I'm talking about technology, and again, I wanna be in the front of it, but not necessarily the pioneer. You know, the old stories, the pioneer gets the arrows in the back. I like to think about technology in the context of the post-pandemic scenarios. What I said in the, uh, the uh, seminar I did for ACEC was that there is a technology triangle that applies to our markets. And if you take technology and you're at the high end of technology, an example would be uh, transportation. At the very bottom of the transportation, picture a triangle, at the very bottom of that triangle, would be things like roadway construction, basic roadway stuff. Uh, when you get a little higher up that technology triangle, you might find long span bridges and some more specific technology. When you get to the top of the uh, technology triangle, you might find things like intelligent transportation systems and you know, preparing for uh, autonomous vehicles and all those kinds of things that have a more specialty to them, a niche. And my, my belief is that the higher you up are up on that technology triangle where there are fewer providers of the service, you can command higher fees. If you're at that bottom of the triangle where there are width of a, a very broad range of suppliers who can do that work satisfactorily, there's gonna be some natural fee pressure to keep the fees low. If you, on the other hand, find some specialty niche that you can move up that technology triangle, then you command a higher multiplier. So I, I do believe technology can differentiate us but you've got to figure out, I think, whether the technology's uh, important from the standpoint of the clients. You know, I think, <clears throat> I think um, technology can be a differentiator in the marketplace if it helps our clients solve their problems, does something beneficial for them. But to me, that's the driver. You know, many times it, we have employees who are eager to practice with the latest technology, and so they're pushing for it. And my advice is make sure you have a strong business case for that specialty or that technology uh, that it's going to actually make you more profitable in the end before you invest in it. Um, to sort of close up, um, uh, in, in your talk, you, uh, you, you said that you, if you were doing strategic planning with the firm right now, you'd be, you tend to be a little more conservative 
than you might have been, say, a year or two years ago. Um, within that, what 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 would where would you plan for growth? Well, I think I am a little more conservative now, but let me clarify because I may have left the right impression from that uh, webinar earlier. Uh, I would still pursue growth, both in terms of market share and hiring the right new talent, but I would do it cautiously. So for instance, I know many skeletons in the closet of firms that in the past have opened offices because somebody got a wild idea that, boy, that looks like a great market to be in. And they would try to enter these new markets based on that sort of arrogance that we can come in and play. My contention is, even if you're the best in the world at what you do, there may not be room, room for you to play in a new geography. As long as the client base there is satisfied with their existing providers, that means they may not be open. If they're satisfied, they may not be open to a new uh, entrant into the market. And so I would still be doing market research on new markets and geographies. I, that's no different than I would have and, uh, recommended during the pandemic, but I might do a little bit more uh, structured research now. I might put a little more energy into doing that because I can't afford to be making wrong decisions. I would also be really significantly looking for talent. And there are a couple of things that are happening that make me believe that. One is, I think one of the post-pandemic outcomes is going to be a new flurry of competitors. What I mean by that is there are a lot of folks, very smart, bright people who've been working for us, who've gotten a taste of working at home. And now there's, there's a movement toward virtual firms where you get a group of these experts who band together under an umbrella. They have a website, they have a company name, but they're scattered all over the place. They don't even have an office building and they work on projects together as sort of a virtual firm. So there's no real estate footprint, they're all online. And that's the best of both worlds in their opinion because they get to command their own schedule. They can bring bench uh, strength into the firm as necessary and let it go as necessary, depending on what the project is. So I think there's gonna be a fundamental shift here in the post pandemic world from those kinds of things that have happened in the workforce. So I would be spending a lot of energy right now in figuring out a way to keep my employees engaged, provide opportunities for growth and development for them, be on the market for new talent. I mean, if it means cherry picking talent away from your competitors, why not? I think that's how you have to be prepared and you can do it cautiously. One thing that it may sound counterintuitive, but I think you should always be in the market for new talent. Most firms wait to hire a new person until they are overwhelmed. When they are so busy, they can't stand it. My belief is you hire ahead of the curve, 115% of today's capacity. Uh, first of all, that's a, a hard thing to achieve, but secondly, it's the mindset that says when the right talent comes along, we'll hire it because that person will become immediately productive on your staff. That person will bring business with them oftentimes, so based on their personal loyalties. So I'm always in the market for talent. It's sort of the build it and they will come mentality. So cautious, yes, but certainly not uh, where we just bury our heads in the sand and don't keep moving forward. And I would, on that point about searching for talent, the, the geographical constraints are gone now. You don't need to, a firm based in St. Louis doesn't need to look in St. Louis. They can essentially look anywhere. Absolutely true. You know, one of my clients years ago had multiple offices and their, their whole model was sort of, they had offices in places that seemed rather strange. Uh, but what they did was they opened an off offices in places where they could find talent in a specialty market. And so if their specialty market was in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, they opened an office in Grand Rapids. If it was in uh, you know, a small community in Utah, they opened it in a small community in Utah. Their whole focus was we have to kind of, you know, create offices in the t geographic territories where the talent lies. You're absolutely right. We don't have those constraints anymore. People can and do work from anywhere. And so we've proven that with the virtual firm concept. I'm be much more interested in, in look, broadening my scope now geographically and looking for talent uh, anywhere rather than in my backyard. Uh, that's how you build, I think, bench strength and how you build a, a cadre of experts that will uh, put you ahead of your competition. I think that's a great place to end. I, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Very much appreciated, Jerry. Thank you so much. We've been talking to John Getty, who's president of Getty and Associates in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And you've been listening to the Engineering Influence Podcast presented by the American Council of Engineering Companies, 
and sponsored by the ACC Life Health Trust. Thanks for listening.